Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here on time for church. It's good to have Kunda and Sanjay back after their long trip to India. They look refreshed and uh, ready to face the rest of the year. So before we begin our Sabbath school lesson, let's have a word of prayer. Can I ask Sanjay to lead us in prayer, please? Guidance of your Holy Spirit, especially your sister Lalita, that she presents the lesson. Maybe have receptive minds and listening ears that we may learn <coughs> the lesson that you have in store for us today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to in, uh, welcome all the visitors to, I'm sorry I didn't mention that, and all of those that are viewing us on, on, on live stream. Today we are going to be studying lesson number nine. Can anyone tell me what's the name of the lesson? Yes, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It is a very interesting Sabbath school lesson. Can someone read the memory verse, please? Kunda? Thank you. So this quarter we're studying about the Psalms, and uh, today we're going to be studying about the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Psalms testify, the first paragraph in, in our Sabbath school lesson, it says the Psalms testify about Christ's person and ministry. We certainly can testify to that. And then it says, the second paragraph, the topics revealed in the psalm include Christ's deity, his sonship, his obedience, his zeal for God's temple, his identity as a good shepherd, his betrayal, his suffering, his bones have not been broken, his death, his resurrection, ascension, priesthood, and kingship. <clears throat> and uh, this is all predicted many centuries before Jesus came in the flesh. Isn't that something? That uh, all of this is predicted before Jesus came in the flesh. So you know, it can be hard for us to kind of grasp this. But we need to try to understand what the psalmist wrote. And, uh, and they did it. They did it so many hundreds of years before Jesus came. You take, for example, Exodus. That was about 1450 BC. And then you have, that was before Christ. And then you have Abraham. And that was before that. It was 2,000 years before that before Christ. So all these people had to look forward to the coming of Christ. We find this all building up in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ. And then after 2,000 years after the fact, we should really be excited because Jesus has come and his coming is even closer than we can believe. And now we, we are here on the very edge of the end of time. <coughs> and now, look, of all the people, God has permitted us, you and me, to be born at the very end of human history. Isn't that something? For us to be, God permitted us to be born at the end of human history, I always look forward you know, to the time when the apostles, <clears throat> um, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were going from place to place. They conquered the whole world. But we are more privileged than them, that we are, we are born at this time in Earth's history. And so we have the accumulated light of the ages. Do we have a work to do? Yes. We have a great work to do to hasten the Lord's coming. 
Does anybody have any questions about this? The introduction? Okay. Sunday's portion. If not, we'll just continue with the Sunday's portion. <coughs> Divine self-sacrificing shepherd. So what does this remind us of? Divine self-sacrificing shepherd. We are all familiar with Psalms 23. So shall we uh, repeat Psalms 23? All of us repeat or read Psalms 23? It is... Uh, shall we all do it together? Okay. The Lord is His, my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes... He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou God and thy staff, comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, um, my dad, when he was young, uh, before, he got to, before he became an Adventist, he used to look after the sheep in his village in his, for his dad. And he would go out to the fields, and they'd go from place to place looking for pastures, right? And he would tell me, you know, it'd be raining. We had to look after the sheep. And I, they had this uh, gunny sacks. And so he would have to sleep on the gunny sacks. He said, we had no um, raincoat or umbrella to protect us. And we were soaked and we were wet. And those sheep that were sick, we had to carry them and we had to look after them. And he said, I think it is because of that that I don't get sick. You know, my immunity has built up from then. I said, how awesome that is. Even till today, my dad is doing good. Um, being a good shepherd, and you could even see it in his life, being very kind and tender-hearted and a good, loving shepherd and a father and a husband and a grandfather. Psalms 23 means a lot to everybody. I, I remember when I was growing up, <clears throat> uh, my neighbor, their sister uh, had gone to Kuwait, and she had a baby, and, and things didn't go right. And so while uh, she was passing away, the baby was born normal, and she was repeating Psalms 23. And those days, they had the cassette player. You remember the cassette? And so they had brought the cassette, and we were all listening to her repeat the, Lord's, the uh, Psalms 23. It's such a comforting psalm. You know, it doesn't have, to, and you also see it, a lot of it mention, uh, people have used it at funerals, at memorials, and even, even before you go to sleep in the night, you just read Psalms 23 and you just feel so comforted, right? It's so peaceful. Um, and this is a brilliant psalm, and, and somehow it has this universal appeal that impacts and touches the personal heart, a person's heart and mind. It has a promise of hope. It starts off depicting God as a self-sacrificing shepherd, and we as his sheep. It's, a very short, it's very short and accurate. In this psalm, we see how God is prepared to protect us, to save us, and then to have us live with him in heaven for eternity, forever. I think that eternity is something that really triggers something in us, especially as we grow older, right? That this is not the end of everything. There's an eternity, and that eternity is not a boring eternity. It's full of life, full of fun, full of enjoyment, being in the presence of God. <clears throat> and um, if, uh, if we can, if we can um, turn our, uh, go to the lesson, and the first paragraph in the lesson on Sunday's portion, divine self-sacrificing shepherd. 
the image of the Lord. Can, can somebody read that? of his people, the people's dependence on God to meet all their needs. The image conveys the notion of closeness between God and his people, because shepherds lived with their flocks and cared for each sheep individually. The pastoral ima imaginary also underlines God's ownership of his flock, guaranteed by two strong bonds, creation and covenant. The image of the divine shepherd who leads Joseph's like a, uh, Joseph like a flock. Perhaps Just our first paragraph. Okay. Thank you so much. So we see this, uh, uh, they have two strong bonds, right? The first uh, uh, bond is creation. If somebody could read uh, Psalms 100 verse 3. Roy, can you read it for me, please? Roy is sitting next to Kishore. Verse 3, 100 verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth in all thy diseases? No, Psalms 100 verse 3. Not 103, <laughs> Were, uh, chapter 100 and verse 3. 100 verse 3. Mm -hmm. Know ye that the, Lord, that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So that's one rightful claim that God has upon us. He is our creator. And the other is through, the, through redemption, through the covenant. So... Um, can I ask Shilpa to read Hebrews 13, 20, please? Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that, bought, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Thank you so much, Shilpa. So the covenant is now redemption. Both of them are go together. And that was between the father and the son before the days of eternity. Let's see what does Jesus say about himself as the good shepherd. Can somebody read John 10, 15, 11 to 15? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. <coughs> the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and, and I know my sheep and am known by known by my own as the father knows me even so i know the father and i lay down my life for the sheep so here we have so here we have um, jesus saying that he is the good shepherd and the sh a shepherd lays down his life for the sheep i'm sure the people that were sitting around him, listening to him, hearing him from a distance, must have said, what a loving shepherd that must have been, that must be, to lay his life down for the sheep. For his, the sheep. But little did they realize that he was the Messiah. Little did they realize that he was the good shepherd and um, that he was going to lay down his life very soon for all of us, for all of them. And that is something that um, these people fail to realize. It's so sad for them, for, for them that they did not recognize him as the Messiah. So John says that he is a good shepherd and the shepherd gives his life for the sheep. <clears throat> so 
We are so fortunate to have such a wonderful um, shepherd in our lives. Does anybody have any questions? I'd like to have more interaction. Uh, Psalms 23 is very common. Tenoli, do you have anything to contribute? Sorry for picking you up. <clears throat> Here we see how intimate God feels with his sheep. So they are animals and how much he loves you and me. Yes. And he went after that one little sheep which was lost. I don't know if I'm a mother. I don't know if I have ten children. If one is lost with her, I'll go after that child. I'm sure you will. I'm just telling you, you know, because our human tendency, we are not like God, right? Mm -hmm. He loves us so much. But his love for us is too much. I cannot just fathom it. That's what I want to say. God's mm. love, we cannot just uh, apprehend. Yes, yes, amen. You know, they say that sheep are the most dumb animals you know, if they see running water, they'll never drink water from a running water. It has to be calm. It has to be quiet. And then that's how they would drink their water. Yes, Sushila. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say, like, uh, Jesus as our shepherd, we have nothing to fear, you know, because he's always taking care of us, and we are fortunate to have him as our shepherd, who is always there and takes care of everyone in whatever needs we are in. So he's a good shepherd. We are fortunate for that. Amen. How, how, I mean, we know about it, but practically in our lives, do we call upon the good shepherd? The shepherd comes running after for us, right? He hears our voice, our despair. He comes running and he rescues us. And he carries us in his arms. He's very intimate with us. Um, and uh, he doesn't allow anyone to, uh, to suffer. He doesn't allow anyone who cries on the Lord to go unheard. He's there before they, he, they even call. Now, moving, anybody else have any questions? Yes, Mohan. All this while we keep talking about the good shepherd. Yes. Of course, we already saw the fact. It's, it's the truth. But what do we do? Because he's going to separate the sheep and the goat. Unless we reflect his name, the name of the Lord, there is nobody under heaven, the Jesus name, mm -hmm. than Jesus name. So what I would like to suggest, uh, it's not suggest, what to say, share, is God is merciful, he's good, he's going after the wounded ones. We are wounded. But if we do not go to him, uh, his name, Get, get the victory over that. What I have, the ones that is, uh, the things that are holding me back, he will not be loving me anymore. He said, yes, I've given you enough time. Probation is closed. Until then, <laughs> when the Holy Spirit is working in us, I got to myself, I got to make sure that I'm right with my God. If not, I'm not a sheep. He loves us so much, even when probation closes and we are lost, he's still going to cry for us. I'm sure his heart goes out to um, Lucifer and his fallen angels. But he's not going to do anything. No, he cannot do anything. Yes. But yes, but his heart is so, a heart that is so full of tender mercy. Thank you, Mohan. I, I kind of want to add, I yes, add to Kishore. that point. Uh, in John 10, the same chapter, uh, Jesus starts off in verse 7 saying, Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Right? Then he says, All that ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So we as sheep are supposed to hear Jesus. We are supposed to enter into Jesus. Right? Still small boys, they speak to us. Yes. Yeah. And then it also mentions, so that's a responsibility that how we prepare as his people, right? We are to enter into Jesus. We are to hear his voice, Amen. right? In Revelation, it talks about um, those that follow the Lamb. And though, that is who we are supposed to be. Uh, but more than that, I think also, it, Jesus, when he's talking about the good shepherd, also talks about the hireling, mm -hmm. right? So there's people that are under the shepherd that are watching the sheep. 
but they don't risk their lives. Mm. When Christ has called us, we are no longer just sheep, but we are also under shepherds mm -hmm. as well. We have spheres of influence. So there's pastors, there's leaders in the church, elders, uh, there's heads of the home, so family members, fathers, mothers. They have their own flocks. And the same characteristics that Jesus as a shepherd has, that he lays down his life, that he's willing to risk everything for his sheep, we are supposed to have that love of Jesus in, in our hearts that we would take care of the flock that we have been given as well. Amen. Yes. Yes. So it is our duty to, you know, come to him and ask for forgiveness, but he never gives up on us. And everybody be saved? No, all those that have chosen. What does the Bible say? There, uh, there's a hand raised behind. I think to answer that and in response to partly to respond to that question, he, we hear or his sheep is supposed to hear his voice, yes. but also to know the voice. Yes. It's a different thing to hear and to know, because if we don't know, we'll be led astray. Hmm. But we know we are supposed to know his voice, and how do we know his voice? By studying his word by accepting what he tells us, by living a life that is according to his will, then we get to know him and get to uh, become close to him so that we can know and hear his voice and respond. Amen. And that's, that also means that we need to spend more time in meditation of the Lord. Yes. <clears throat> now moving on to Monday's portion, Monday the, suf the Suffering Messiah. With this theme in mind, let's turn our Bibles to Psalms 22. <clears throat> I want you to know that uh, this, this psalm has been foretold many years before it actually happened with, in, uh, with Jesus. We see how the people treated Jesus as he was hanging on the cross. And notice how abusive they were. So I'm just going to ask... Uh, um, people to read just the messianic passages that are there. If somebody could read Psalms 22.1. My God. Oh. Okay, thank you, Thayer Moli. I'm going to come back. At the end, because it is very meaningful, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Sharmila, can I ask you to read verse 6? <clears throat> but as a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised <coughs> by the people. You can see this is applied to Jesus. And if you can read verse 7 and 8 also, please. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Thank you so much. So you're familiar, familiar with this. Remember, this was happening around the cross. They wagged their heads as their enemies were exalted. And at last, they nailed him to the cross. I can't imagine them doing that. They said, if you are the son of God, come down and let's see if God will deliver you. They were mocking him. And we are all familiar with this and how they shook their, ha their heads. And if somebody can read verse 12 and 13. <coughs> Many things have, you. Of have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening, ravening and roaring lion. And if you can read also verse 16, please. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Thank you so much, Miss Helen. Well, this was hundreds of years, even thousands of years before crucifixion was even invented. Can you imagine? And David wrote this. <clears throat> and, he, and, and, uh, and then you see, when it really happened, they actually pierced his hands and his feet. And that is just incredible, right? To think of something that uh, David wrote much earlier before they even thought about crucifixion. 
And um, it just blows my mind. <clears throat> if somebody can read verse 17 and 18. <coughs> I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for the clothing, they, they cast lots. Thank you. <clears throat> isn't, that, isn't that incredible? All of these came to pass exactly as we read it in scripture. Nothing was amiss. Okay, and of course, the first verse when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David said it because he was going through a lot in his life. But here is the thing. Jesus is crying on the cross not too long before he died. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If those scribes and Pharisees, as they were strutting around, exalting what they had really done and, and really understood what they did, they knew those words. Everybody knew the Torah and everybody knew Psalms. <clears throat> They were familiar with, uh, and they knew Psalms 22. <coughs> if they had really been in tune with God, they would have realized that this carpenter of Nazareth, who they counted as a worthless felon, and they had engineered his crucifixion, they would have recognized that he was actually quoting from Psalms 22, 1. And they would have looked at one another and said, surely this was, this is the Messiah. These men had evidences around them and this is why judge and this is why in the judgment it is going to be so dreadful for these leaders <clears throat> these spiritual leaders because they knew they had evidence the holy spirit was speaking to them convincing them but they you know uh, did not want to listen to the holy spirit they dug their heels and they said we are not having him as our messiah jesus the carpenter of nazareth the messiah yes Mo mohan <coughs> me do we go through that experience now do the trials come now the temptations come now is my faith being tested this is the time we go through this experience my god my god have you forsaken me but god said i've already overcome thank you mohan yeah that comes at the end <clears throat> I wonder how they will, how will it be when, they, when Jesus comes the second time? In Revelation 1, 17, 7, it says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. When Jesus was on trial before the Jewish hierarchy, he says, I tell you, this is that my father could send me two, 12 angels, uh, legions of angels, and hereafter you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of glory. <clears throat> Those men will be raised especially in a special resurrection. How awful to be in that resurrection. The time when Jesus comes to behold him. Can you imagine the horror they will feel? It is all going to come rushing back and they will wish that they had never been born. But the reason Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he and his father were one. They had this communion. They were the best of friends. You know, if you were like this and you didn't have your friend for even one minute, it, it, it makes you sad. But this is in a different position. He's suffering. He's in agony. He wants somebody, he wants a human being to tell. He wants his God to be there. God was always there by his side and God was nowhere. And he, he knew about the, uh, the agreement that they made before he came down to this earth. But the father hid himself in the darkness beside the cross. And if he had shown himself visibly, everybody would have died. But he was there actually suffering with his son and pain. Not on the cross, but, uh, but he was suffering. And I mean, it's just the same as us. When our children go through pain, we go through it more than them, right? Even though we try not to show it. <clears throat> And the father still felt the pain and the anguish in the son's soul. It broke the father's heart. He had to stand there and hold the cup of his own wrath to the lips of his own son. And there in the darkness, Jesus was totally unaware. It had to be that way 
This part of what they had agreed, Jesus had to tread the wine press alone. And he was totally convinced that his father was gone, and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is why in the moment of the, um, in the moment, the loneliest place in the whole universe was in the heart of Jesus. And the darkest place in the whole universe was in the mind of Jesus. While the darkness of eternal oblivion and his father, and his father gone in the darkness of sin upon him, is just beyond our ability to comprehend. But praise God, he suffered that for us. Praise God for that. And he loves us so much, and, and we just take it for granted, right? We don't even turn back and spend time reflecting on this. Mrs. White says to spend a thoughtful hour each day on the final scenes of Jesus' crucifixion. If we only did that, if we only did that, our hearts would be transformed, our hearts would be changed. We would look at people through the eyes of Jesus, right? And my prayer is that we would do that. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to be reading from The Desire of Ages, page 573. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. That's yours and my sins too. The wrath of God against sin. Terrible manifestations of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. We should think about this more often. And we should at least read something about the cross every day so that we would be reminded that um, we would be reminded that that uh, what God did for us. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to, uh, does anybody have any questions on this before we move on? Anyone? Um, it was so profound that Jesus did this for us. You know, it was before the foundation of the world, they planned this. Now, Tuesday, anybody? No, nobody has anything? Yes, Kishore. So I think Uncle Moen had asked about, um, don't we experience as, uh, as Jesus, where Jesus said, you know, why has thou forsaken me? Um, and we do. It's part of the human experience to go through. We can't hear you. Uh, not with the mic, but. Um, so I'm saying it's part of the human experience for us to go through low points in our lives. And it's, it's nice to know for us that the God that we served went through the lowest of the lows. Right? And if he can go through those lows, and, and God was with him, even if he couldn't see God with him, right? So there was darkness around the cross, and God was there still in the darkness. We know that God is with us too. Jesus himself promises us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Even at our lowest point, God is with us. And, and uh, you know, the thing in Hebrews, it talks about our high priest, uh, who was tempted in all aspects like us. And when we know that, when we have those feelings of, uh, where are we? We know Jesus went through the same thing, and we know Jesus overcome through. We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb as well. <clears throat> so I just wanted to add that um, to kind of say, you know, Jesus went through it, uh, just so, and, and we can go through it as well because He conquered until death. Until death yes. Amen. Thank you so much, Kishore. Anybody else? Okay. The next one is, uh, the next lesson is Tuesday's lesson, Forever Faithful to His Covenant. I'm not very uh, comfortable with this, but everybody can help out in this. <clears throat> what is that covenant? Well, let's read this, uh, Psalms 89, 27 to 32. 
If somebody can read that, to know what is this covenant. Eighty nine, twenty seven to thirty two. Our, our wine makes my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him for evermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Is it twenty seven to twenty nine? You read? No, I didn't read it. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Okay, thank you. First, he talks about the firstborn. Was David the firstborn? He was, he was number eight. He was the eighth son. So the, he was the firstborn in terms of title deed, in the sense of privilege, in the sense of power and in the sense of authority. So in the Old Testament, the firstborn is one who received inheritance. So um, who do we find in the Old Testament that received inheritance? We find Jacob, he was supposed to have received it, but he, he stole it from his brother, right? And then you, uh, and then, uh, you have also, Jesus was not the firstborn when he was born, but he is the firstborn of his father. So Jesus is the firstborn in the sense of title deed, in the sense of inheriting inheritance. Some people confuse the text in the New Testament with Colossians and Revelation, and it talks about Jesus being the firstborn. They think the firstborn of all creation. This is a time, this is a time when there is no time, and when time did not exist, and then Jesus came forth into existence. That is not true because Jesus was there, was the firstborn from the beginning, right? He stepped into time. In, biblical, in the biblical sense of having the power and authority of the Father and the title deed, the inheritance of the Father. Then it talks about the covenant. If somebody, uh, and in verse 28 it says, my covenant shall stand firm with him. And 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever. <clears throat> So God made a covenant with Abraham, and Abraham will have a son that the Messiah will come through, and that Abrahamic line, in that Abrahamic line, so the seed that is the prosperity, prosperity from, of Abraham, it goes to Isaac, then it goes to Jacob, then it goes to the 12 tribes of Israel, and then it goes down to the Davidic line, and passes down to the birth of the Messiah. So what do we see in this Tuesday's lesson? We see a Christ who comes forth and who's always faithful to his covenant. He'll be faithful to the covenant he made to Abraham. He sent the Messiah to provide eternal life for us. <clears throat> this is what I gathered from uh, this uh, faithful to his covenant. Um, yes. So in the Bible, during Bible time, mm -hmm. um, does it mean that all the inheritance or all the property goes only to the firstborn? I, I don't know. I'm just asking. I want to clarify. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody with an answer? I don't know the answer for that, but uh, we don't know. We all struggle to get an answer. Let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts. And the, the, Jesus, the Trinity, mm -hmm. nobody was born for eternity. They have been there for eternity. So let's not get confused with that. When it comes to man's salvation, Jesus is the firstborn. He took upon the fallen nature of man, fully man, and he did not commit a sin, a tiny sin at all. And he died for us, and he's the firstborn who won the victory. Other people, no way, even the angels, no way, they were created. This man is the firstborn because of our salvation. So he's the firstborn. Amen. And uh, about the, <laughs> the property and all inheritance, 
I think that's an Indian said, custom. I'm going to give everything. Maybe when you go to heaven, he will give us a galaxy. I don't know. Yes, yes. That's a, that's a wonderful thought, Mohan, that God might give us a galaxy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? Yes, yes, Mr. Must Chitam. don't get double portion of their fathers. And he is the spiritual leader of the household. Okay. And about the firstborn of Jesus Christ, he's the firstborn of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. That's yes. what Colossian says. Yes, yes. So we have to see in that first context, yes. Thank you. Matthew, do you have anything to contribute? <clears throat> about, uh, okay. Yes, Elsie. In the story of the prodigal son, the younger son asked for his portion. So it means they did get some portion, but um, the, um, the house and the property around that area, I think it belonged to the older son, eldest son. Yes. The special, the special uh, portions belong to the eldest son. Yes. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, people still continue it, try to continue it in this day and age, right? They say this is the eldest son's portion. Uh, this is his blessing. Right, and we try to follow it all along. Any other, uh, any other uh, um, questions? What about daughters? <laughs> daughters, the daughters have no part in the property. That's the old, but nowadays daughters are also included. Everybody gets an equal share. Yes, Sanjay. Yeah, I, well, it's, I just wanted to add the portion of responsibility. It's not only property, mm -hmm. but there's also responsibility. And therefore, that responsibility, the, the greater responsibility of taking care of the estate and the others was bestowed on the firstborn, I believe. And so it's not only getting property, but also responsibility. Okay. The uh, offer. One more point, which we touched on. Please. Uh-huh. Jacob uh, and Joshua, when they entered the land of the promised land, except only these two, Caleb had five daughters. Mm -hmm. Did they get the inheritance? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. yes. They got the inheritance. They fought for it. No, they didn't and have to. God said, yes, they, they deserve. Yes, yes, but they came and they asked. You won't get anything unless you ask. You know, from God or from man or from your parents, right? Yes, so we need to be, uh, not rights, it's, uh, it's a portion of the blessing of the family. Okay. I think uh, and time is running out. The offering is being collected. Um, let me just go to, then we have on Wednesday, the eternal king of unrivaled power. Um, we see him, uh, we see in Wednesday's lesson that he is the eternal king and that we have discovered so, f and what have we discovered so far in the Sabbath school this week? Christ is the divine shepherd while he leads, guides, and protects his people. And then we see he's the suffering Messiah, one who bore the guilt and shame of all humanity for his people, one who redeems us by his cross. Tuesday's lesson, he's forever faithful to the covenant. He will be faithful to the covenant he made to Abraham. He sent the Messiah to provide eternal life for us, and he's the eternal king of unrivaled power in the Psalms. He crushes his enemies. <clears throat> and uh, he's the eternal king of unrivaled power. And we read this in Psalms 2, um, 1 to 5 and, and 8 to 11. The fact that he's sovereign, the fact that he's supreme, the fact that he's all-powerful, uh, is uh, we find this in the psalm. Then Thursdays, is it, uh, he is uh, the eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> um, God had sworn, uh, you know, what is the difference between Jesus' priesthood and the priesthood of the Old Testament? Um, we read this in Psalms 10, 4 to 7. I'm just going to leave it. We find that the priest, uh, priesthood, they came from the tribe of Levi, but Jesus came from the tribe of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was an individual who came on the scene. He doesn't have a genealogy written about him, which is very unusual in the Jewish culture in the, of the Old Testament. No genealogy, but that shows that Jesus came eternal. He's the priest of Melchizedek. He's the priest forever. So Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. Jesus has forever priesthood, and the Levitical priests, they died. They couldn't continue forever. Jesus is eternal. He will never die. He would be our high priest forever and ever and ever. Not only is he our high priest, he is our supreme judge. So Jesus is priest, 
and he's, he's the judge too. And uh, let me just conclude this lesson uh, by just saying that, so we have here, we have Jesus who is a priest forever and ever, after the ordinance of Melchizedek, never had a beginning, never will have an ending. The Father anointed him, commissioned him as a priest, and Jesus is harmless, undefiled, unspotted, the perfect priest, so we can come. And we come with all our weakness, we can, <clears throat> we can come with all our sins, and we lay it at Jesus' feet, and we find grace and mercy and forgiveness, and this is the good news. So with that, we can just say Jesus is our shepherd who constantly guides us. Christ is our suffering servant who never leaves us. Christ is the keeper of the everlasting covenant, and Jesus is our high priest, the one that is living for us now and forevermore. That is something to rejoice about. And uh, so to close this Sabbath school lesson, can I ask um, um, someone to pray? Um, Kishore, can you pray, please? Day. Lord, we thank you for this time where we can study your word, and Lord, to understand a little bit more about who Jesus is. Lord, we uh, ask that you would help us to see you as our shepherd, oh Lord. We ask that you would help us to see you as our sacrifice. Lord, we ask that you would help us to look to you as our high priest. Help us to be encouraged in all things, oh Father, and help prepare us for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your heart.